everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jewelers webinar series. Today's session features Senior Editor, Brecken Branch Trader, and three guests. Jewelry designer Dana Brothman, founder of Dana Brothman LLC, Dave Siminski, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at United Precious Metal Refining, and Laura Galvis, uh, the Alliance for Responsible Mining's Market Development Executive. Before I turn the discussion over to Brecken and her guests, I just want to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can drop it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of their screens. I'll be back on after the discussion to share any questions with our panelists. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Friday, May 20th. Now, I'll let Brecken get things started. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michelle. And thank you, of course, to my panelists for being part of this session today. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Um, we're here to have a very important conversation about sourcing of gold and what that might mean when it comes to um, responsible or what jewelers perhaps should be thinking about at this time. Um, before we dive into that, I'd like to take just a few quick moments for you guys to um, introduce yourself, tell our listeners a little bit about what it is you do in the industry. Um, so Dave, I'm going to jump to you first since you're right to my left. Okay, great. Thank you, Brecken. My name is Dave Siminski. I, I work for United Precious Metals. I'm the vice president of sales and marketing there. I've been at the company 29 years. We are the largest U.S. owned primary refiner in the United States. We also manufacture um, jewelry based products, uh, solder wire, golden sheet, casting grains and alloys for the jewelry trade that we both sh ship and supply domestically and internationally. Great. Thank you so much. And Dana. Hi, I'm Dana Bronfman, and I'm a jewelry designer. Um, I have a fine jewelry business in, based in New York, um, and I uh, am a Fairmine licensee, as well as work with uh, recycled metals. And I'm very passionate about this topic, so I'm excited to chat and learn from my peers as well. Thank you so much, Dana. We're excited to, so excited to have you here. And Laura, last but certainly not least. Hi, I'm Laura Galvez. I'm the Market Development Officer for the Alliance for Responsible Mining and Fair Mind. I work leading strategies to be, bring more responsible gold to international markets, such as the Fair Mind 100 Challenge and also the Fair Mind Virtual Edit that we have going up since the beginning of this year. Um, I'm very happy to share this panel with, with you guys. And I'm also very passionate about you know, sustainability, responsible practices, and also about jewelry. So I hope I'll, I'll bring some very interesting take from, from what we do with ASM to this panel. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so let's dive into it. We're gonna talk a little bit about recycled gold today and of course, um, gold mining, but I'd like to kick things off with the former. So um, Dave, I'm gonna throw this to you and maybe you can help us sort of set up defining what we say when we're re referencing recycled gold. Okay, thank you, Brecken. So the first thing I did is I was like, all right, I'm pretty confident, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, let me do some research to make sure that, that I'm on par and I don't get embarrassed and anything like that and make sure I'm going. Then I'm looking around for the past three hours, I'm researching exactly Dana, Laura, who everyone is on the panel to make sure that you know everything goes well. And I'm looking different definitions recycled and I'm like, after three hours, I'm like, I'm getting confused. I'm actually getting confused, which means if I'm getting confused and I've been in the industry 29 years, the industry itself's got to be confused about it. And I'm like, this, this is really, you know, it's crazy. And the problem is, to be honest with you, the, the term recycled has been, it's just too broad based at this point. And no one really knows what a true definition is when it comes to our industry. You know, everyone now, what happens is in, from the jewelry industry is looking for recycled metal, recycled gold, recycled silver, recycled platinum, recycled uh, palladium. It's recycle, recycle, recycle. In most of the big box in the, in the mainstays of, of the, our industry, mining is like taboo right now, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, and it, it's just considered taboo, which is really just wrong, but it, it's what's happening out there. So the problem is recycled metal, there's not enough recycled metal under the definition of what it truly is to feed the entire industry. This is really what I've been doing the past six months, talking to competitors, talking to manufacturers, talking to certifications, talking to the media about all this, try to get the word out and stuff like that, where we don't really, the term recycled is really not the right term. We should be looking for what's called responsibly sourced metal and non-conflict. 
That should really mm-hmm. be what we should all be striving for. If it comes under those two definitions, there'll be plenty of metal out there. But when you keep taking away all the feeds of what recycled metal is, because what my definition of recycled metal is, is basically when you're taking in jewelry scrap, manufacturing byproducts, you're taking in casting trees, you're taking in even coins, investment bars, you're, you're basically remelting it, you're refining it at certain stages, you're remanufacturing into other products. So that to me is what it's in part of the recycling program. Others have debated that saying that it's not. So this is really what the term is. So then when people hear recycled metal, they're like, well, how are you 100% recycled? You know, how are we, how are we tracking this? This is really what we're, our constant uh, argument is and our, our debate with people, to be honest with you, is because hmm. at one time we had one person in our compliance department. Now we have six, just to make sure that we're green, clean, ethical, sustainable, all the buzzwords. So then when someone asks, they can buy the gold or buy the material from us and they can get the certificate and then they can satisfy whoever's asking them for it. That's, right. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And I think it's one of those issues that we run into a lot when, we, when we're talking about responsible in this area is that there's a lot of words that mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, which is why these conversations are so important to have. Um, so let me go back to that a little bit. So you're saying, you were saying that there's not enough material in the pipeline if we say recycled material, excuse me, recycled gold is everything that's not mined, basically. Everything that's already on the market is being reused and recycled. And there's is, not enough to feed the industry if we if we there, there really isn't. And what happens is is and then certain certifications and certain organizations have definitions of what they consider recycle. Others have their own definition. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of synergy and harmony between that stuff, to be honest with you. And that's right. what that's what what is taking the whole mining thing out of the way. And the argument to me or, or my 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 conversations with people is does everyone understand that all gold came from the ground? I mean, it already came from the ground. Okay, so you can't you can't basically say that mining's all bad. It, it's not. We need that in the supply chain. We have to have that in the supply chain. We have to have that. We're able to use remelt coins and investment bars and all that stuff. And to give you guys a quick example, in 2010, gold was nineteen hundred dollars and eighteen hundred dollars, and there was more metal coming into everyone's place than ever before. You saw we buy gold signs all over the place. You saw people buying gold. Retailers were living off the scrapping portion of the business. It was great. 12 years later, 2022, metal price is that high and it's not coming in. So if it's not coming in and the jewelry industry is going gangbusters the last 18 months manufacturing jewelry, Mm -hmm. where are we going to get the metal? Right. So it stands to reason that we're going to eventually have to turn towards mining and making sure that those, you know, sources are responsible, ethical, clean sources, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's a good segue into, you know, let's talk a little bit about mine gold then. So, you know, this is for everybody, in your opinion, you know, should the industry be turning to mine gold? Um, what should they know about that sector? And maybe Dana and Laura, for you guys, what should they be thinking about as they're diving into um, mined gold, working with it? <coughs> Do you want to start, Laura? Or um, I have a few things to address. So yes, <laughs> sure. Um, and and it goes very much in hand with with what David was saying. Uh, but first, it is very broad to talk about uh, mine gold. Um, so rather than turning into mine gold, and as David was saying, I believe the industry should be turning into like a collective awareness about the origin of the gold we are using, right? And with that, start making sure that this gold is mined under responsible conditions and hopefully turning into responsible artisanal small scale gold mining. Um, Why this sector in particular? Because it represents 90% of the workforce of the industry. And we're talking about over 20 million miners that depend from this activity. Um, And by turning to SMG, M gold, um, the industry would be improving the livelihood of these miners. Um, and then there's also the dilemma that he was addressing about this um, comparison between recycled and mined gold. Um, given that every single gram of gold available or recently mined is still mined gold. Um, and, and the dilemma also that I have is that uh, we wrongly assume that recycled gold is old gold and when it could be mined just a few weeks ago um, mm-hmm. by, you know, in this comparison with, with some of 
the like definitions are or more recognized definitions of re recycled gold is it's just gold that has been refined and there is no visibility of the conditions where it was mined nor um, how far it, it was. So it just up to the point when it was returned for a second refining. And then um, also just that it is transformed gold. It is not, not the concept and the word recycle gold is relatively new in the industry, but the practice of transforming gold has been around forever. Um, basically since gold has existed, it's been very valuable and um, goldsmiths do save every single scrap they can and they always try not to waste any gold. It's, it's not a waste, so it's very hard to talk about it as recycled. And the reason, just as David was saying, that we have mined gold nowadays is that uh, the availability of gold is not enough for the capacity um, in which we are creating and the existing demand. But um, then there's also like this thing with recycled, it is easy to understand. The concept is a lot easier to understand than talking about responsibly mined gold, you know? This mm -hmm. is a lot easier to understand. And the positive thing about it is, is that it, it helps to um, help us to start questioning our sources and when it comes from. For, for many brands that work with fair mine, uh, it used to be a, fair step, a first step then. And then they start questioning, seeing where it comes from, and they go all the way um, then to joining us as, as licensed brands. Yes, great points, Laura. Thank you so much. Dana, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I well said, Laura. I agree. Um, I think I don't think we're doing any good by avoiding mined gold um, because we're not actually improving the mining sector. We're not were when I, before I started working with Fairmine, I didn't really understand the full context of, you know, why, what was happening with recycled gold and, um, and how that wasn't, that was actually even a Band-Aid solution. And maybe it can say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not part of this problem, but actually in a way you're actually contributing to the problem by not supporting the solution to the problem, which, one possible potential solution is investing in improving how mining is done and actually allowing it to be formalized and allowing people to do it in a way that, um, you know, that benefits them and is not toxic to the planet and to the people around them. So um, I think it is important to support um, artisanally mined gold. And I think it's important to uh, have honest conversations with customers about what that means um, and you know what we're doing. Uh, of course, we have to not completely, we have to meet customers where they are. If they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it that day. But it's important to just say, well, maybe a little bit, be a little bit honest about how, what recycled gold can be and um, you know, how, it's not necessarily bad to do mine gold because it's it could be doing something very positive at the same time to be supporting mine gold. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Fairmind and what Alliance for Responsible Mining are doing are great examples of how the industry can lean into that um, and sort of answer the questions about what it means for the future of responsible gold mining. So um, Laura, if you could tell us a little bit about like dig into Fairmind and what that means, you know, what you guys go through to have people be certified. Sure. I'll start by talking a little bit about ARM for those that may not be familiar with it. The Alliance for Responsible Mining is a Colombian nonprofit organization that is recognized as a leader and pioneer of responsible ASM industry um, and the organization that created the Fairmine um, Initiative. And Fairmine there is the, um, the highest assurance level that certifies that gold comes from an empowered, responsible, artisanal, and small-scale mining organization. And it improve, and it provides an easy access um, uh, to these trace gold and, and to these certified gold. Um, and mm, it ensures the social development uh, and the, throughout the supply chain from the mines to the final consumer. 
And then how we achieve this, the mines are certified. Uh, we work with mines that comply with very strict and progressive list of requirements that focus on uh, the organizational development, which is um, one of the biggest challenges for these mining organizations, given that about 80% of the ASM and the ASM industry are, are informal organizations. Then they focus. They have to focus also in social development. No links with conflict situations. No child labor, and supporting gender equality um, in this predominantly male industry. Uh, also improving uh, conditions for the workers, providing them a stable job, guaranteeing their well-being according to health and safety regulations and local regulations, and then also environmental protection, which is one of like the biggest issues that we have with ASM gold, you know, reducing the use of chemical substances or eliminating them in many cases, such as it is with fair mine ecological gold. And also um, ensuring the proper handling if there's there are any chemical uh, substances involved, protecting the water sources and ensuring that the mines operate in a small scale. Um, and by being certified, these organizations uh, go through the most challenging part uh, and, and make great efforts, but they are also recognized uh, by getting access to, well, Fairmine provides access to international markets, um, ensures that the miners are receiving a fair price for their gold and also gives them, uh, awards them with the uh, premium price for the gold, which is uh, four grams of gold for Fairmine. For $4 per gram of gold for fair mine gold and six for fair mine ecological gold. Um, and which is this gold that I was talking about, fair mine ecological gold, which uses no, no harsh chemicals such as mercury and cyanide. And then we also work with the um, refineries and authorized suppliers. Um, who will purchase from the from the mines, transform those gold into the casting grain or, or the products that the, then the jewelers and, and the brands will need, um, providing again, this easy access to the market. And finally, we have the Fairmine licensed brands such as Dana, uh, which are gonna create products and, and then um, use it to, to give it to, to the final customer. And then that's basically how fair mine works. A little Amazing. summary throughout the yeah. supply chain. I mean, it hits on so many different points, I think, that concern people. But I have to imagine one of the biggest ones that you touched on is sort of the environmental. I think why people turn away from mine gold is they hear, you know, use of mercury, which is obviously not only harmful to the environment, harmful to the miners as well. And I know that there's a huge sort of um, a small but growing movement in the industry to focus on you know, different ways of doing it and certainly possible, we know, I mean, not easy maybe, but possible. So um, I think that's very interesting and you guys are certainly doing such a good job with it. And Dana, from your perspective, I'm curious to know when you're communicating that to the consumer, does it take sort of a lot of um, time to explain what it is that means and, you know, communicate what Fairmind is and why that benefits them as well? Um, there's ways to, to share that. Um, sometimes, a customer isn't interested in, you know, where it's coming from. And that's just the honest truth. Mm -hmm. um, but I do explain this is Fairmine certified gold. And this, um, it basically is the highest standard of ethics and sustainability in the mining, um, you know, in gold mining. Um, so I kind of liken it a little bit to fair trade. I say it's not an exact comparison, but you can think of it that way that allows, uh, I can, I can get more in depth if they want to hear it, but I usually start with kind of a general quick description. Um, if they're willing to, if they're willing to hear that. Um, and oftentimes yeah. if I'm doing like a custom project, I'll offer people the example, um, of what fair mind is or, or, you know, or the recycled option, um, and they can choose. Um, and uh, then I can, we'll be able to get into, you know, more into more depth what it is um, if they want to. But there's a quick way to just say it's fair mined um, and responsibly mined gold um, that improves mining um, in a way. 
Got it. Okay. Well, we, not to steal a question from Michelle, but I was watching the chat and we just got an interesting one that said, do customers even ask about gold or they just ask about diamond sourcing? So I don't know, Dave, I'd be curious from your perspective as well, if this is a conversation that's yet happening or if it's sort of, you know, a designer such as yourself, Dana, who feels the personal responsibility to make sure rather than a consumer driven thing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll answer first. A couple of things is, um, you know, when you're talking about Fairmine, Fairmine is a third party certification, obviously, you know, for the artisanal mining. It's no different for like recycle gold and refiners. Between RJC, between the SCS, between the RMI, I mean, we have so many certifications on covering different levels all the way through. If there was enough recycled metal in the pipeline, this wouldn't even be much of a problem. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with, with the, from the mining aspect, of like the Fairmine that I see, is just if you're saying, oh, Laura, it's four dollars a gram. That's one hundred twenty dollars an ounce. So what happens is you have most massive, you know, small, even jewelry designers on Forty Seventh Street in New York, all over the place. They cry and scream when gold's three dollars over an ounce when you sell it, or four dollars, or ten dollars. At one time, most of the guys in New York were buying gold at a dollar over. Now what happens is because of supply chain, it's cost a little more expensive. So one of the one of the things is that's why you know recycle gold and stuff like that where it's a big deal if we could recycle that gold and we're not pulling it out it's way more cost effective for, and and you know basically because you're only going to pay a couple dollars over for whatever and it's still certified and all all that type you know everything that we need on our end too when it, when I asked the retailers Brecken about um, uh, the majority of when the customers come in you know what are they asking for most of it truth be told it is about the stones. And very rarely okay. is it about very rarely is it about uh, a very rarely is about the goal. You know, a lot of designers will ask about it because a lot of designers have that passion and they're able to tell that story, you know, because they're, they're designing those pieces for, for, for their customer space and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But basically the mass market, that's not happening at all. So less of a consumer driven, you know, it's more of just a so we need to find solutions for the industry of where to source next, how to source next, that kind of thing. And I believe for my ass. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Dana, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, I was just going to say in terms of having the conversation with the customer, they don't always, usually not actually ask about the gold and where it comes from. Um, but it's just part of the conversation when I'm telling the story of the piece. Oftentimes it's a part of these are Colombian emeralds and this is the story behind it. So it's part of telling the story behind behind that because why I chose the materials is part of what makes the piece special and important and part of the value of it. Right, definitely. So if you guys, for our, uh, excuse me, listeners, if they were interested in getting into this conversation and figuring out, you know, responsible sourcing, where to look next, where should they turn? What resources could you offer them? Or even what sort of questions should they maybe be starting to ask to steer themselves in the right direction? For, I, I would take this first. What I would say is it starts with getting involved in panels just like this, getting on webinars, seeing different people's points of view. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing and opening your mind to what is actually out there, asking a lot of questions, being involved in the chats, get involved in your, your, your local jewelers association, join, join some of these certification programs, see the, all the stuff that's written online. When I was going researching today, the amount of stuff that's online about all the initiatives is actually wonderful information. If you really want to really, you know, instead of just getting like a little thing on Twitter, you can actually go and go deep and you can actually learn a yeah. lot about, uh, I mean, I've learned so much this morning just by researching where, where both of the panelists are from and what, what they've done. Yeah, that's a good point. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, Laura, did you, sorry, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, and definitely um, to look at relevant initiatives. There are local initiatives, collectives all around us. You know, if you're in the States, there's Ethical Metalsmith and, and many initiatives, the Chicago Conference and, and worldwide as well. We have local collectives of people that are in this situation that are already taking steps to see um, how to look for transparency, uh, and also very important to look at the claims that people are doing and analyzing how transparent this is. Absolutely, thank you. So following up on that, um, I wanna talk a little bit about, I'm sorry, Dana, did you have something you wanted to add? I was just gonna say there's, Please. you know, to add on to what both uh, 
but what everybody has said, I mean, absolutely. But, you know, ARM's website has a lot of great information and Fairmind is not the only option. Um, ARM also has a sustainable minds program that they're working on, um, you know, artisanally small scale mining that is not yet Fairmind certified mm -hmm. um, and following like a continuous improvement model. Um, there's also one called uh, Zahobu Safi coming out of um, Africa that Christina Miller has been working on. Her living room sessions that are not always about gold, but um, but you can uh, join her living room sessions to learn about different topics around similar types of issues. Um, and they even have different panels where they talk about the, um, the ASM gold um, on her project. And there's so many different initiatives. So I think... Uh, spending some time on, you know, Ethical Metalsmith's blog to the source and also mm -hmm. to um, on ARM's website. They have a lot of information, you know, in addition to these other places. And I just have to advocate strongly for the um, Chicago conference. Um, it's called the Chicago Responsible Jewelry Conference. That's been the most in-depth conversation that I've learned about, you know, all topics in the industry. It's incredible, um, and I think it's highly worth going if you are just thinking that you want to just do one weekend and kind of get a lot of information. It's definitely the thing to do. Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great addition, Dana. And I have to agree with you. Susan does such a great job organizing um, the speakers, and I think you know to even get the conversation started in your head and to meet people who are like minded. Um, just going on my, you know, for National Jeweler, I've met so many people that have been sources for me um, in these conversations. So I agree completely with that. It's a great event. Um, I want to move on to talk quickly about uh, sourcing of Russian goods. We're not going to go too deep into this. Um, it's, I think, beyond a little bit today's, but um, we, I think we just have to talk about it quickly. So when it comes to gold, um, our friends over at JVC confirmed this for me right before we um, hopped on, but there is sort of restriction um, when it comes to gold, which essentially says that gold transactions are prohibited if they're designed to find a way around sanctions or are tied to sanctioned entities. Um, I'm gonna drop a link right now for anyone who's listening who might wanna look into that a little bit more. And thanks again to JVC for providing that. You can see kind of what we mean by that. Um, but beyond that, it's, you know, it's a very convoluted area and there's still a lot the industry should be looking at. So, um, Laura, I'm going to start with you because I know that ARM was part of an open letter to the industry that was sent out um, a few months ago, I believe, you know, sort of encouraging people to ask questions, be vigilant in this area so that they're making sure their gold isn't, you know, sort of unknowingly and unwittingly supporting um, Russia coming from players that they might not be keeping track of. So what would you like to reiterate here, I think, when it comes to that for the industry to think about? Um it goes very much in hand with with what we have been talking about this whole idea and reinforcing this idea um, about the importance of investigating thoroughly and having the awareness of where your gold is coming from. Um, because if we don't know it, there's a great chance that we are supporting irresponsible practices. In this case, it's financing Russia's war against Ukraine. And um, one of the safest things uh, people can do to, to ensure is, is to join initiatives that war warranty um, the gold comes from responsible sources such as Fair Mind. Um, but you know, this unfortunate events, the thing is they have brought a lot more light into the importance of verifying our sources um, and to start making the right questions to identify to your providers and to your suppliers to identify that you are not, not helping this um, irresponsible practices, for example. And when dealing with precious metals and also with luxury items as consumers or producers, we tend to assume that we're working with the best in many cases. Um, so if we fall short in questioning where, what the origin is, well, we might be supporting this. Um, and this, this open letter that is open for, for people to still sign um, is a stand, a first step in assuming that uh, we should be uh, responsible as part of the industry and work in, in improving the transparency and increasing transparency in the gold supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Um, Dave or Dan, I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add on that perspective from your 
side of the trade as well, babe, you look like- So I'll just, because there was a, a, a question in the chat, but it's just like, I, I'm gonna say like from, because people are asking how do they, and maybe this was, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here, but when they're asking where the gold comes from and all that stuff, I can tell you from United, we're a primary refinery. So we only take business in from jewelry and pawn. We don't actually take any refining in from mining. We don't take anything in from electronic, from dental, from industrial. That's our choice, okay? Because we're in the we're in the jewelry space. That's our choice. That's how we've always done it. That's like we. That's why we're always saying this: the stuff that's coming into our facility, we see it as trees, rings, necklaces, pieces, stuff that's already been manufactured. You know. So this this is what you know what I'm saying. So when I'm looking at that question in the chat, Bracken, if I'm sorry if I'm branching off, but that's all right. It's it's like. You know, how do you how do you differentiate when these designers and these retailers are walking around, you know, the shows or and are asking these questions? You know, how do you say it? I mean, I can only say it from our standpoint of where it is and all that. You know, we've made that decision, and all that stuff. But either the biggest thing is what happens is, and like I said, I might be going ahead is you just got to keep asking questions. You got to just keep getting involved in all that type of stuff. And listen, like I said, I think or I, I know the RJC had some missteps but I know they're trying to clean that up They're Hopefully they're going to get better for it. They've done so much mm -hmm. good. You know, I said, and RJC is one of the people that to be honest with you, police our industry. So does SCS. So does the RMI. So what happens is if, if it's, if we have a strong certifications in the RJC, just like, you know, Fairmine is strong for, for their, for what they're doing for their, for their certifications of the mining industry. And so like that, this helps everybody. Right. You know I mean, it's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Dave. That's a great point. Um, Dana, did you have anything to add or? Um, just, you know, both what Laura and David have said, I think it's, um, it's just important to be asking the questions. Um, and, uh, the more, you know, the more you can, the more you can actually, you know, pass on that confidence to your customers. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think there's so many questions. I think I want to go ahead and let um, jump over to those. But before we do, is there anything um, that we've addressed you guys want to go back to anything else to add before we start moving into audience Q&A? Anything to circle back to? If not? Um, from my side, an invitation um, to support the communities that source our precious materials and to recognize the importance of their labor in the industry, you know, um, and uh, to support them also means to help them adopt better environmental practices and very social practices. Now, the, one way you can do that is, is by joining the Fairmine Initiative. We have a lot of flexibility for uh, many, especially for brands in the industry to, to join and, and start like taking the first steps towards working more responsibly. And right now it's a great time to do so. We have the Fairmine 100 Challenge. This is an invitation to all the actors in the industry to create a, a collection using Fairmine metals and uh, to be also participating to be recognized as one of the best um, brand, the best collections in uh, made with Fairmine. Michelle is actually going to be participating in our panel of judges, which is going to be very exciting. It's an amazing all female panel of judges. And so we invite everyone to join us. I know uh, Dana is planning to, to participate also with a collection. Can't wait to see her beautiful pieces made with Fairmind Gold here participating. And so no, just an open invitation to everyone to support the communities. A great way to do is with the Fairmind 100 Challenge. Yeah, very exciting. And that's open through um, August or September, is that right? Yes, to August 31st. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Laura. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and let her get to some audience questions and see what else our listeners want to know. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. This has been so informative. And I feel like, as Dave said, I've learned a lot. I mean, and you know, we read and write about this stuff all the time, and there's still stuff so much to learn. And Dave, you even said you've been in this industry, what, almost 30 years, and you're still learning. So I think this is one of the best ways to learn. And also, um, a lot of the questions we had, I just going to give kind of a blanket statement, seem to, some of the questions we had seem to center around, how can you know where your supply is coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of reminds me of, Brecken, you were there, the Russia panel we did about Russian diamonds a couple of weeks ago. 
I think the answer is that there's no easy answer. There's no one form to fill out. There's no one website to visit. There's no one button to press that you really just have to educate yourself on what's out there. And I've been dropping all during this uh, conversation links into the chat of various things we've talked about. And we're also going to be including these links in the article. So if they were going too fast for you, you want to rewatch the session, we'll be including all those links. But I think the answer is how can you know where your gold is coming from? You just have to start at square one and start educating yourself on what's out there, what's being traced, who it benefits, and where it comes from. I don't, there's no easy answer. There's no one button solution we can give you. Um, so the other, the kind of, a lot of the other questions to center around this question, which we get a lot with any kind of uh, sustainable, quote, sustainable product is around cost. So there's kind of a couple of questions around in this space. So one listener wanted to know, Fairmine Gold has such a high premium. Can we get more context on why, as well as how affordable we think it is for smaller retailers and designers? And Laura, I'm going to turn this over to, to you to start. Well, um, it is that expensive because unfortunately in, in the world we live in, it, it, it is more expensive to do uh, things responsibly, right? So this is a recognition to um, the to the miners. It used to be um, in the way it was designed at first, it was thought to be like a percentage. Um, and right now it, it, with the prices of gold, it's a lot lower than that percentage that could be, I don't know, about a 10%, I believe. Um, it's a lot lower than that. And so um, it is a recognition and an effort that we have to make. There are other options. As Dana was saying, uh, at ARM, we don't just have Fairmine. Fairmine is our, our highest uh, assurance level, but do, we do uh, work with, with other types of miners and there are other alternatives. Um, and we also provide alternatives, for example, by using uh, a mixed sourcing model where you can combine a little bit of fair mine gold with other sources of gold and make claims on a corporate level about the usage of this gold. But it is important to recognize this very, very great efforts in, uh, that the miners do. And that's why we have the, the highest premium um, from any certification and also the only available ecological gold. Uh, or certification for ecological gold. And Laura, I think you make a good point. It's it's more expensive to do anything responsibly. It's why we see you know higher costs for products made responsibly in agriculture, for example. Why you pay more for like a certain dozen eggs versus a different eggs from a different company. I mean, it's along those same lines. If you're doing it smaller batches, you're paying people fair wages. Then it's going to cost more. I, I just want to add that it's also an incentive for the mines to to adhere to the standards, because without that, are they going to go the extra mile to adhere to all of these difficult standards that do end up costing them more um, if they're not receiving a payoff for it? Because at the end of the day, they're trying to make a living just like everybody here. Um, and that is their reality. So they have to have some kind of incentive to do that other than, other than just, um, other than just, you know, the goodness of their hearts. Right, right. It's, it's a business and there has to be some financial reward. There has to be some financial payoff. Um, Dana, I want this, you to answer this next question. I'm curious about this. Someone wants to know responsibility slash sustainability comes at additional costs and many consumers are willing to pay for it. They want to know, are many willing, consumers willing to pay for it? I want to ask you specifically, you mentioned earlier that actually a lot of your customers don't ask where the gold comes from, but what is your, their price when they do ask, presumably they do care, how much more are they willing to pay for something if you say, well, this was, this is this versus this versus, you know, how much are they willing to scale up to say, I want the most responsibly sourced product you have? Usually they are if they're committed to working on something. Uh, they don't initially ask, but if I offer them, they get excited about the possibility of supporting, of supporting an initiative like this. So it's not necessarily every customer, but not every customer. I think it's, the, it's a small difference when you're already working in these higher price points. Um, my part of the industry is, um, you know, 18 karat gold and it's small batch things created in New York, 
and sometimes one of a kind pieces. So oftentimes it's a one of a kind piece and there's nothing else to compare it to. So it's not like it's something that is so standard that they can just go online and search for a lower price. So usually when they're, when they're searching, when they find something that they want or whether it's a custom piece that I'm working on, um, it's they they want what it looks like and they can't necessarily compare it to, to something else. So they don't you know necessarily always know that that they're that that price is included, but it's just part of the value of the piece. Um, you know, it's just the material cost, and I think sometimes it's the difference between it's the difference of a few hundred dollars. And when somebody's buying something that's a few thousand dollars, sometimes they don't mind paying a few a little bit more. Right, right. That's interesting. Dave, I'm sorry. Did you want to add something there? Listen, I I I just come from it a little bit different. Basically, what happens is the jewelry industry is basically an industry that's always been a drill down on margins. It just has. And what happens is you'd have more manufacturing done here in the United States and it wouldn't have gone over. It wouldn't have gone to the Dominican Republic. It wouldn't have gone to South America. It wouldn't have gone to Mexico. It wouldn't have gone to India and Thailand and China if the industry didn't care about cost, because that's why they go over there is because of cost. So what happens is, is no different when the base metal shot through the roof in the last six months of all the stuff that, you know, people are, you know, looking at the gold and the silver, but if you look at the price of nickel and copper and everything, everything's gone through the roof. This industry is very price sensitive. So what happens is if it's a lot more expensive, even a little more expensive, they're going to question everything, even for all the good that it does. Will there be a niche for, for certain things? Yes. But when it comes to uh, gold and silver and stuff like that, they're going to look for where the, the lowest premium and what happens is and, and use it in the mass market. That's what the that's what this industry is really about. So what happens with those but designers like Dan so like that, where they have that it built, they can build that into their margins and their pieces and it tells a great story. Yes, because the person who buys that piece of jewelry has that story to tell when they're talking about that piece of jewelry. But for 99 percent of the other jewelry that's sold from a ratio standpoint. They're not saying they're not having that story, maybe about the stones, but not necessarily about the metal. Yeah, it is interesting how this conversation comes up so much more with di diamonds specifically. And I don't know if that's because of the blood diamond movie and the widespread attention that received and kind of like set the public on notice about that. I don't know if that's what makes the difference here, but it's, it's very true. It's something people definitely ask a lot more. I mean, just being as an editor in jewelry, when I tell people what I do, they ask me specifically about diamonds but no one seems to, um, no one seems to ever say, well, what about gold? What about, where does this gold come from? And what, what is, you know, what impact is it having on the people who are mining it on the environment? You know, it's interesting. Um, I also don't know that people, many people know this, probably people got people on this call do, but you know, gold is used in a lot of things besides jewelry and your cell phone is one of them, correct? Correct. So, I mean, and that's, and everybody has a smartphone. So that's a, that's a lot of gold. Um, so someone just asked, since I brought up the blood diamond movie. So if the blood diamond movie got consumers demanding responsible diamonds, do we need a blood gold movie? I don't know. What, what do we think about that? Well, it would be great to have something as mainstream as the gold diamond, as the blood diamond movie um, for the gold industry to bring awareness into it. Unfortunately, um, we haven't had anything like this. There are documentaries and very special pieces, but of course they don't have the visibility this movie had. Right, right. Well, I, I kind of, I see that and I think there's value to that, but I also don't think that the blood diamond movie led to, you know, diamonds becoming a perfect industry and mm -hmm. nobody, there's still problems with lab grown diamonds. I think all it really did was encourage more interest in that. Um, and it's great to even have a conversation around origin. I think that's important and there's definitely something to be said for that, but it has also led to some improvements in diamond mining, but it has not solved the problem. Um, and I don't know if it will, there's still you know, problems with both mine diamonds and, um, you know, and lab grown diamonds. So I think that, I think it also could lead to people being more and more afraid of, of mined gold as well. Um, right. There, you know, there is a documentary called River of Gold, which is, you know, very sad. Um, and I have heard about that episode about dirty gold. I haven't seen that on Netflix, um, but 
good reminder. Thank you um, to Angelo in the chat. Um, but I have a complicated viewpoint of that. I think it it has to be done in the right way, and there has to be there's no real way to regulate the response to that um, in a way. So yeah. I just want to interject. I didn't mean to imply that the Blood Diamond movie had fixed everything in the industry. What I was more saying is like, I think that's really what put that on consumers' radar. And that's why like so many consumers will ask about where does this diamond come from, but not necessarily ask about gold or even like ask about other gemstones. But um, yeah, and thank you, Angela, so much for that. I'm going to check that out on Netflix. Um, we have a couple questions here, um, here on recycling, which I know we started the discussion with. Um, someone wanted to know, what do the panelists have to say about the recent article studies and commentarians surfacing that are saying something to the effect of using recycled gold is just a form of greenwashing because you're technically just slapping a name to gold of questionable provenance, questionable provenance, trying to fit a square, square into a circle, so to speak. I don't know how many of these articles anyone has read, but if anyone wants to take that. Yeah, I've read them. I've read them all. So just so from Angelo's uh, standpoint on two things, the Netflix, uh, first on the Netflix thing, the dirty goal was more about what happens to more about refineries that basically uh, um, paid cash and did for South America and really hurt when it comes to laundering money. That, that's number one on the Netflix, on the Netflix, on the gold. And, and the greenwashing, let me just say, when, when golds come out of the ground, okay, it usually comes out at a purity of 88 to 92% pure. Okay, so what happens, it's refined the first time to what's called investment grade gold. So what happens, it'll take it'll go to investment grade gold. So the purity might be what's called 295 or 395. Then what happens is it's not ready for jewelry and it's not ready for jewelry grade. So then what happens is let's just say we get investment bars and we'll get investment bars that we have to re refine again, which means we're taking out those impurities and byproducts that will hurt the casting and manufacturing process. So then we're taking it to four nines plus on the gold. And then we're taking that, and then we're taking that material after it's refined again. And then we're putting it either back into back into um, fine gold grain, back into cast grain, back into solder, back into wire, back into sheet products to manufacture jewelry. So people have used the term recently greenwashing. I'm not sure how that could be greenwashing because all we're doing is we're taking something that's basically not ready for the manufacturing of making jewelry. And then what happens is we have to go through two refining processes and a manufacturing process to get to the form that the customer can use. And we're, we're, that's just a, that we're just using that to subsidize because you're not getting in enough scrap gold. You're not getting casting trees. You're not getting in necklaces and broken necklaces that were taken to a pawn shop. One of United's biggest feeds out there are as a pawn shop. So what happens is pawn shops are, are basically loaning money, buying jewelry, and all that type of stuff. And they're sending it to someone like us to get refined, to put this metal back into the, back into the sourcing category. So when it comes to when, when people say, when they're saying they're trying to fit, a, a, as Angela said, to a, trying to fit a square into a circle, that's not necessarily true. Really what happens is, is the more and more that everyone uh, in, um, in these certifications and all in our, in our conversation here, the more and more parameters you put on something, nothing's going to be perfect. But the more and more restrictions you put on something, we're going to get to the point where we're just not going to be able to have any metal for anybody, no matter where it comes from. Because you can find a problem. If you're looking for a problem, you can always find a problem. That's, that's, that's really simple. So um, I hope that will answer the question, Michelle. Okay. Uh, thank you. Laura Adena, you want to talk about the greenwashing with the recycled claims? I don't know if either of you have read any of these articles. Yeah, I have and, not, but it's a topic I'm, I'm familiar with. And I'll just quickly, um, I think that it's, it's not that simple. I think in a way it can be, um, not for someone at, at David's level, but maybe for somebody talking to the customer and saying, oh, this is recycled. But right. maybe the customer doesn't fully understand that it's being recycled more for economic reasons. Um, you know, if it's up at the post consumer level than for reasons of ethics and sustainability. Um, so I think that that's kind of the full conversation. No one's throwing away gold. No one's throwing away, you know, these materials because they're valuable and they are really renewable and, and easy to transform. So I think that that in the way of not explaining that it can be kind of 
taking advantage of the innocence of somebody. Um, but I think a lot of people who are explaining that to the to their customers don't fully understand either. I think I I have been guilty of that um, in the past as well, of not fully understanding that story and thinking I was doing you know a good thing. Right. No, that makes sense. And I like you said, like someone pointed this out in the chat. Either when we think of recycled, you think of you know you buy you buy a plastic bottle of coke i bought one the other day and it said this is made out of other recycled bottles well the good there is plastic would normally end up in the landfill and be thrown away and this bottle wasn't but nobody's throwing away gold so it's all recycled at some point it's kind of a meaningless term um laura any thoughts on the greenwashing concerning recycling yes um well um i also read the 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 article uh, patrick shine wrote about this and it brings a, a very different light to it uh, it's very direct and very of course from the side of asm gold and it also addresses that there is a, a loophole in the recycled industry you know um, there's a report by an ngo called global witness and it highlights that there is um reasonable fear, uh, reasonable to fear that ex uh, illegal materials that are extra extracted illegally um, can go into the supply chain of gold legally by this loophole of the recycled gold, because it just, as I said earlier, it just looks back to the point with, where the gold was um, and uh, returned for a second refining. Um, and so, since it is very easy to transform, well, we can claim that this is uh, talking about recycled gold, about it being something very responsible, but then uh, there is no real uh, knowledge about the origin and the transparency from where it comes from. So um, it is definitely a very, um, like, a big dilemma here and, and a big conflict for us. Um, and that's why, well, we focus on, on, on gold from, from the responsible source that we can certify. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we had a comment come in here. Uh, someone said the World Gold Council's responsible gold mining principles for larger mines are a very thorough product protocol for ethical practices. So thank you for that. If anyone is looking for an extra source. Um, we are out of questions for today. That's all we'll have time for. Um, I want to thank our panelists, David, Laura, Dana, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Brecken, our editor, thank you for hosting. Uh, my next question will return next Wednesday. That's May 25th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to be hosting that. It's a special pre-Vegas episode, and I'm gonna drop the link in the chat right now. I'm going to be interviewing three trade show veterans, Michelle Orman, Neiman Marcus's Eric Ford, and Thomas Davis of Atit Diamonds, uh, discussing trade show preparation. It's a, gonna be a good one. So if you're planning on going to Vegas and you need some tips from veterans, please join us. That link is in the chat now. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks again to our guest. It was a great session. Bye everyone. <laughs>